talk about the roots of anti-Zionism on campus. Then I'm going to talk about the types of anti-Zionists anti because um, there are many different kinds. It's uh, you can't all paint them with the same brush. And in order to to deal to discuss with them to deal with them, you have to know which type it is. Um, you, different strokes for different folks. Different people react differently to different information. Then I'm going to talk, give you some case studies, and I'm going to talk about creative ways to combat BDS. Okay, so the college campus has always been notoriously, you know, has always, always been anti-Israel, well, since the Six Day War. And the roots of this movement are traceable to before 1948. So we want to know why. So first there's ideological roots, there's external pressure, and there's popular frameworks. So first of all, the um, academia has always had anti-Semitic undertones. Um, there have been quotas on the number of Jews admitted to universities. M you know, pretty much every prestigious university in North America has had Jewish quotas, unofficial until the 40s, and then official until sorry, official until the 1940s, and then unofficial um, until about the 70s. They still went on. Um, there's also um, there's also the Gulf influence. So as we know, um, you know Gulf um, you know Gulf Arabs they they pour a lot of money into this, and a lot of students come over and they're indoctrinated and they indoctrinate students. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some theoretical um, undertones to this to why it's so popular um, because. The anti-Zionism of today, um, there was a very clever PR campaign to fit it in with the framework of the social justice movement that is so popular right now. Um, so first, I mean, this is like sort of the boring part because I need to get into the origins, the reason why people think the way they do, so that you can understand the fun stuff later. Um, so Marxism, conflict theory, obviously Karl Marx. Um, all the world is a class struggle. You have the rich bourgeoisie versus the poor proletariat. Many people see this Marxist theory, that it, it's, it literally infiltrates every aspect of academia, and they see it as you support the underdog no matter what. Um, Post-colonialism, it arose following the collapse of imperialism in the 60s and 70s. Um, it's a spin-off of Marxism. So noble savage theory is at the core, and it's actually that's what they call it. <laughs> it sounds it sounds crazy, but it's what they call it. So I'm gonna you know to sum it up this whole theory in like one sentence is, who do we think we are to push our values on other cultures and naively assume that our culture is superior? So it's also recognizing that third world countries have positives that we don't or that we've abandoned through industrialization. So people think you know they look at the good old days of like oh look at these cute little you know, um, they're so much better than us, they're so much purer, they're closer to the earth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so post-colonialism gave rise to cultural relativism. So a lot of people don't really understand what cultural relative, relative, that relativism is. It's a bit confusing at first. So the reason why it exists is because of post-colonial guilt. Um, it is a fear of declaring one culture superior to another because that's what colonialism was based on and they're so ashamed that the colonialist past because colonialism just stopped being cool. And all of a sudden, they're like, they're petrified of appearing colonialist and of their history, they're ashamed. So there are positives and negatives to this, um, to this um, practice. And the positives are that it reduces racism in the community and it increases coexistence. And it allows people to see the good in every culture and borrow from it. So, you know, you don't see overt racism against black people much anymore. It's not socially acceptable because of cultural relativism. The negatives are that it causes the general public to ignore negative aspects of other cultures because they're afraid of appearing racist. You know, I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. So I'm going to talk about a case. I'm going to give you a case study so they can understand this a little bit better. The Orlando shooting. I'm sure all of you guys know about it. It happened last Sunday, and the extreme this Islamist gun, extremist gunman entered a gay club, murdered uh, 50 people, and injured 53. 
so I noticed on my Facebook page that the right wingers were saying Islam is evil. This is why this attack happened because Islam is evil. And then my left wing friends were saying Islam has nothing to do with it at all. And I think both are wrong. Like I just kind of cringed at both of them because they're j it's just such an oversimplification. Now let me go into further um, you know, details about why it's wrong to say both of these things. Um, and it's, I'll tell you why it's related to BDS later. So, first of all, Islam, the whole Islam is evil thing, okay, you can extrapolate that some of the teachings of the Quran, you know, are very supremacist, but, you know, the, the, in the Torah, they also have supremacist things in there, and the same with the, with the New Testament, so you can't just say that Islam is evil, because also we're taught in schools, you know, young people are taught in schools that it's wrong, you know, to be that way, to to vilify, and we're taught to vilify people who say all blanks are blank, you know, be, because it's racist, you know, it, it's a, it comes across as racist, even if you don't intend it to be racist, it just alienates students. So even if you think it's true, it's just not the way to go about it when you're dealing with young people. Um, another thing is that if we cast Muslims out as a monolith, we discourage the ones who wish to speak out and ally with us, because there are many, including one in this audience, um, and who's a good friend of mine, and it ignores political factors that contribute to radical Islam. So radical Islam obviously is not Islam in a vacuum, um, because if it was, every Muslim would be like, would be killing people. But obviously that's not happening. So it's a mix of religion and politics, and that creates sort of the environment where extremism happens. And remember, there are 1.6 billion Muslims, so even if like 0.1 zero one percent of them are extremist that's a few that's a few million that's a lot so it seems like there's so like there's so many extremists but it's really not like that so then you have your leftists on the other side and they completely sidestep the issue of the spread of radical Islam and ISIS even though the terrorists swore allegiance to ISIS even though the FBI said it was a terrorist attack Obama said it was a terrorist attack Hillary Clinton said it was a terrorist attack and they're still going on about how it wasn't a terrorist attack and it wasn't because of radical Islam and you know they sound I mean I think they sound kind of ridiculous because it's really it, it, it's so absolutist to say it's not radical Islam um, especially also ISIS took responsibility for the attack <laughs> so but why do people think this way why did Obama not mention the word radical Islam because it's a belief that if you appease the Muslim world and get them to like you, they'll no longer support terrorism. And of course, that's an oversimplification. I mean, obviously, being kind, you have nothing to lose by being kind. But at the same time, if we if we put our heads in the sand on purpose, it's just going to make us into sitting ducks. Also, cultural relativism is a fear of seeming racist and Islamophobic. So that also contributes a lot to that. So putting it all together, I think I can skip this slide. But you know, there's it's, it's basically people take all these theories and it makes it oversimplify it and say like rich is bad, poor is good, brown is good, brown is good, white is bad, um, you know, the more powerful is bad and the less powerful is good. Um, the whole world is basically like the, the, the people on top versus people on the bottom. And of course that's a big oversimplification. And of course you have fundings, uh, funding from the Gulf states that, that, that sort of um, impose this, this, this attitude on academia. I'm going to go into why this is the case. So our education system primes people to be anti-Israel. It really does. It primes you. Um, and I'm going to talk about why. So because our education is seen through an absolutist Western lens. Everything's oversimplified. Um, so white is colonized, brown is colonized, and it ignores colonialism by brown people. Why? Because it doesn't fit the mold. So we never learned about Arab colonialism. We never learned about the Ottoman Empire. We just didn't. And there's a reason for that. Teachers are so scared to teach students that because it might offend Muslim students. And well, why? How come we constantly badmouth ourselves, but we're too afraid to badmouth the East in the same way? Because West can handle self-criticism and the East cannot handle self-criticism. It's a cultural difference and it's, it's, it's very, very widely documented and it's very evident. So, you know, if, so the West are like, you know, if you tell something bad about the West, if you say the West has X problem, the Westerns be like, yeah, we can, we do. It's terrible, and they'll just go on about it. If you tell like someone that the you know Islamic world has a big problem, they'll get really defensive. It'll be like you're attacking their mother, because there's a, there's a collectivism there. It's like 
you know, it's, they don't see themselves as I, they see themselves as us. They see that the family is the most important thing. It's us, you know, so they, they, they see you as attacking them. You know, when you attack the, the East or, you know, any culture in the East. So they're, they, they see just petrified. This is Said's Orientalism. Um, it is a book that was a seminal work of his and it really strongly influenced the fa how anti-Israel rhetoric became the academic canon. So he is almost single-handedly responsible for making it part of the academic canon. So what he basically taught in a, in a very, very oversimplified nutshell, and I know I'm being ironic here talking about how people oversimplify and I'm oversimplifying, but basically white people necessarily oppress and look down on non-whites, and he used Palestine as an example, you know, finger quotes, Palestine. Um, so Jews are white, are evil, Palestinians are brown, are virtuous, and he couched it in academic language and used all of the rhetoric that I discussed previously. The, it really made it sound academically legit. And that, uh, that really um, did a number on us. So I'm going to tell them my story. So I was raised in an Orthodox Jewish family, uh, you know, initially anyway. Um, public, so I, I started out K to, K to 6 in a, in a modern Orthodox um, school called Akiva. And then, when I was in seventh grade, I went to into the into the um, you know the non-denominational the public system basically. And so, what we were taught is that the underdog is always right, that war is always bad and is always wrong and is always uncalled for. So we had teachers constantly saying Iraq is the war in Iraq is awful, the war in Afghanistan is awful, Vietnam was the worst mistake we ever made, and it's literally completely. I didn't realize it was one-sided. I thought it was objective um, because every teacher was like this. So we also were taught, you know, implicitly that capitalism is evil and the corporations are greedy and ruin the planet to enrich themselves. And I remember I came home one day, and I think mom remembers this, um, I remember going up to dad and saying, you know, dad, capitalism is so evil, we need to end capitalism. And this is like, I think I was in 10th grade. And, you know, my dad was like, what are you kidding me? Capitalism is the best thing that ever happened to us. Like, what are you talking about? Don't you ever say that again? And that was the first time I've ever been exposed to an opposing view that capitalism is not evil, you know? So it's so entrenched. And we're also taught that the UN and NGOs, labor unions, we, we're taught that they're heroes. They save the world. And so I personally, you combine that indoctrination with the fact that I was taught that the Jewish community, you know, I felt, you know, as somebody who went to high school outside of the Jewish school system, I felt that the community was very exclusive. It was very conformist. And I felt alienated by it because I felt like I didn't fit in anywhere. I didn't fit in with the Orthodox, and I didn't fit in with the, you know, w which I was went to, you know, K to six, and I didn't fit in with the non-Jews. I was kind of stuck in the middle. Um, and so I turned to social justice activism because, in social justice activism, you belong as long as you toe the party line, as long as you agree with everything they say. You have an automatic friend circle, you know, and they really like love each other and respect each other, and it's like a family. So this is me and my social justice activism. You know, stand with Planned Parenthood. You know, gay, I went to a gay rights rally. Um, I, I go to gay pride all the time. This is me. Um, I did this like trans um, awareness project and I went and drive with my ex-boyfriend. Um, you know, I was really involved in that and I, I still support these, 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 these particular causes, but you know, I'm not an activist anymore and I, and I understand the other side better. So this is something that I posted on Facebook in 2014. So if you can take a look at what I said, I said hopefully the negotiation would help get rid of the settlements in the West Bank and we can start taking baby steps towards peace. So I used to support J Street. I used to be very, uh, very leftist. And I was against the settlements. I thought the settlements need to be taken down right now. So that was me back then. And I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail later about why and how I changed. But we need to talk about um, the anti-Israel students, the different kinds, in order to be able to deal with, to, to address them. So we're gonna focus on left-wingers because I've never actually seen a right-winger who is anti-Israel on campus. You know, it's, it's a very, very small minority and we shouldn't even care. So does anybody wanna read the first case study? Anybody? Or should I? Go ahead. Okay, so and I made these up, by the way, they're not real people. <laughs> Sabrina Miller grew up in a secular home, a mix of Irish, Scottish, English, and Dutch. Sabrina does not have any particular connection to any religious, or community group. Since her youth, she's always been a voracious reader, eager to learn about whatever she can get her hands on. A freshman at McGill studying political science, she is in awe at the quality of education she's getting and admires the work her professors do to help make the world a better place. 
especially for the downtrodden. These professors are mostly anti-Israel, and they know better than her, so they must be right. Okay. So who are they? Academics, students, professors, researchers, and they're mostly in the humanities. Um, academia has a leftist bias. It's very self-critical. Some academics take this self-criticism a little bit too far, and you know, you put a magnifying glass on your own culture for a while, eventually you start to hate yourself. Um, it, it, it's pretty inevitable. <laughs> um, so being surrounded by this mentality constantly can foster contempt, you know, and it's interference in foreign lands. And so the enemy starts to appear like this, like amazing, and you start to think like, because you're so used to criticizing yourself, you see yourself as bad. Um, so obviously much of humanities literature is based on oppression. This is like stuff we already know. Um, you know, they think that we stole land and that's, you know, that we're white colonialists, we stole land. I mean, everyone knows that, that that's what they think, so I don't have to go into any detail. Um, so the professors who they admire are more likely than not to be anti-Israel. So they see their professor and the literature in the field as the absolute authority and what is correct based on quote unquote rigorous research. They see the evidence of supporting anti-Israel claims, so they go with it. You know, they don't question what they're taught. Who does that? Very few. And also to fit in. You know, you're seen as legitimate in your peer group if you're anti-Israel. I mean, history professors, for example, they won't get tenure if they're pro-Israel. You know, it, it really is a, an old boys club. And intellectuals love to challenge authority, which means that the official policies of one's own government are often criticized. and to the point where it's like they're almost like it's the other direction. So because the government supports Israel, you know, the academics hate, you know, don't like Israel. So um, how do you how do you deal with them? You know, look at this. So you have to cite facts. Intellectuals love facts. If, you, if you're dealing with an intellectual, you have to like just cite a document or this or that, and that will go very far with them. Don't debate them. Discuss. You have to discuss a situation as nuanced and complicated, even if you don't think that is, because it makes you sound smarter. Um, and pointing out sources. So you say, for example, this um, institute is actually funded by Qatar. So if you point out sources of bias, that goes a long way with them too. Um, and so don't call them anti-Semites. Whatever you do, even if they are blatant anti-Semites, it puts them on the defensive because it's it's for them. They don't they don't do it consciously. It's subconscious. Um, because if you if you learn about how Israel is evil for so long, eventually you just start to hate Jews. You know, it's 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 a natural, and they don't realize they're doing it. So instead, you could say that you're oversimplifying things because that's like a, you know for academics, it's like oh my god, I'm oversimplifying. I need to really go deeper, you know, and that's what they're they're into that. Don't make broad generalizations. That's a death knell in academia. They that just make you look not very intelligent. Case two. Sorry if you guys are falling asleep. Um, hope to keep you guys awake. Um, Laura O'Neill is a 37 year old Irish Catholic mother of three. I'm sure all of you guys know somebody like Laura O'Neill. Um, she's exuberant, fun, charismatic, and warm. She cares about the people, um, about her friends and family, and she tends to give people the benefit of the doubt. She's gregarious, she has a tight group of friends, and they bring their kids over, so there's always the pitter-patter of little feet and the high-pitched squeals of young kids filling her home. Every night at 6 p.m. after she's fed the kids dinner, she watches the 6 o'clock news and sees images of dead children in Gaza. She immediately pictures it happening to her own kids and her friends' kids, and her heart grows heavy. Israel is evil, she thinks abusing its power and it needs to be stopped, especially since Canada is supporting it. So this is, guys, raise your hand if you know somebody like Laura O'Neill. Yeah, <laughs> she's very common. So who are they? They're very intuitive, emotional people, mostly mothers. And I hate that I have to make it a gender thing, but in my experience, people that are like that are mostly women. Um, I don't know. It's, I don't know what it is. If it's maternal hormones or what, <laughs> you know, it's just the way it is. So how? What are their influences? The sensationalist media, the images on TV, other bleeding heart friends, and their posts on Facebook. Um, these women are usually very impressionable and easily emotionally aroused. They're not very educated most of the time, and if they are, they've been out of school for a while. So why do they do it? The great fine. Everyone else does it. They see they see kids and they imagine their own. Hollywood. I'll get into that a bit later. They're impressionable and they believe a lot of what they read and hear. So they're prone to believe in conspiracy theories. They believe the underdog is always right, at least intuitively, and they love broad, sweeping generalizations, unlike the academics. So that's why you really need to know who you're dealing with. Hold on, play. Okay, so look at this picture. What do you think of when you see this picture? You think, what is this person doing? The soldier is brutalizing this poor, innocent kid. 
But then you look at the big picture and you see there's a film crew, there's the cameraman, these are all actors, they're laughing, they're joking. It's called Pallywood. They make it the whole industry of fooling people into thinking that Israel is the devil. And it's working. Because, you know, what happened? Oh, whoops, how do you go back? Yeah, that's right. No, the other one. I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah, one more. One more. Yeah, I know. There we go. Okay. Okay, good. So another thing they do is they take pictures that are, that are happening in Syria. There's a huge conflict in Syria. Over half a million people were killed. And they take a picture from Syria and they say this is happening in Gaza. And nobody questions it. Oh. Sorry, I don't know what's going on here. There we go. So just you see this picture, right? And this is like and so what, what happens when you deal with Pallywood, I think it's the hardest thing to deal with because you have these people, and how do you tell someone that their lived experience is false? How do you tell them that this picture is false? You know, they, you, you literally give this whole paragraph about how Israel is legitimate, and they answer it with this picture, you know? And that Israel is not brutalizing Palestinians. Israel does not want to do violence, and you get this picture. So how do you deal with it? So when you see an image, it can be, your first thought is, how do I debunk a picture? How can you deny somebody's lived experience? So you need to tell them that it could be one of three things. Either it's Pallywood, so like we just talked about, staged to help them win the PR war. Either it's provoked. So for example, you know, you can see this kid over there. This kid is throwing a rock at an IDF soldier. She's provoking them. She's getting them to feel threatened for their life and to hold them down. And then the cameraman who's in the background waiting for a good shot comes and takes a picture of her being, oh my god, help me, help me, help me. And it just makes, you know, it makes the soldier look Bad, but really the soldier was being provoked and the provo provocation is just not shown at all so or it could be um, so or it could be just the fact that um, it could just be so there's the three piece there's um, there's Pallywood there's provocation and there is um, there's problematic so it's problematic when um, okay I'll just go into it. so it's problematic when um, because it's, it's against the law for an IDF soldier to, um, to subdue, to touch any Palestinian or anybody um, unless they feel like their life is threatened. So if somebody is doing that, then they should be prosecuted at the fullest extent of the law, and they probably were. We can all just don't talk about it. Okay, so type 2, the bleeding heart. Simple-minded, average, or below average intelligence, and if you think about it, 84% of people can be classified as average or below average. I mean, making the upper limit to be one standard deviation above the norm for intelligence. It's a lot of people. Um, they oversimplify everything, you know, because they can't understand complex ideas. They can't understand new ones. So, more casualties. It means the guilty party. You know, lack of critical thinking. So they believe that Israel is the oppressor and the Palestinians are the oppressed, mainly due to the media and psych warfare, and it represents the trickle down of Marxism into mainstream, um, into mainstream society. Belonging, you know, also get into adolescent psychology. Kids are, these students are not, they're, they're young adults. They're still teenagers in many ways. They're, they're smart enough to understand, but they're not self-assured enough to stand alone. So you need to appeal to young people's desires to be cool, to fit in, to belong, to follow trends, and to appear grassroots. You have to seem relatable, like you're just like them. Otherwise, they won't relate to you. Everyone else is doing it. See, this is SPHR, this is what they did, all these people. Look at all these other students that are supporting Palestine. You should support Palestine too. Look at all these professors who are boycotting Israel. It's appeal to authority on top of that. Look at all this beautiful artwork that, you know, that they um, that they produce that makes it look like some, you know, some passionate person their age did it, not like some evil corporation. You know, as I'm talking about you know, what we're primed to believe that corporations are evil, and if it's too if our messaging is too corporate. We're going to turn them off. So piggybacking, you connect topics to you know that people are passionate about 
to make people passionate about that topic too, to tie the two together in their minds and feel equally passionate. So you have this, you have France, Belgium, Palestine, Espana. So, you know, you, you link things to each other, so the people that care about Spain will also care about Palestine. So I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to, you know, go very quickly through this. Jewish struggle for self-determination is very important. Prove that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism. Why are they only okay with Israel? When we're, well, why, why are they only not okay with Israel doing the things like that? When worse human rights violations are ignored um, in other countries? Explain how the media is biased. Discuss the statistics. Like, for example, in Gaza in 2014, 67 percent of all the casualties were men of fighting age. That's definitely not that's definitely not the population. Um, and if you look at the fact that elderly men and people under age 18 could also be involved in this this militant mili uh, this terrorist warfare, then it's 80 percent of all the people who died in the Gaza conflict were male. Think about that pretty self-evident, and this is Gaza's own statistics. You also need to talk about, you know, the Qatari and Saudi funding. You need to point out the bias that's inherent in what we're learning. Case three, Ahmed al-Shahid. Born in Tunisia, Ahmed moved to Montreal, Canada at 11 years old. Naturally, his family gravitated to other members of the Tunisian community, and because it was small, the Muslim community welcomed him with open arms. Um, his grade six classmates made fun of him because of the different way he spoke French, so he sought solace with other Tunisians and Muslims who accepted him. The narrative he had been raised with was that Israel was illegitimate and perpetuating horrific human rights violations against his own brethren, the Arabs. It was also seen as part of a package, a small but necessary condition for fitting in this community. An inkling of sympathy towards Zionists can lead to ostracism, so he and his friends bonded over immersing themselves in their narrative. In a way, it's the glue that holds Muslims together, and a way they can express their Muslim pride. the hardest group to convince. They're pretty much heavily ingrained, you know, the social consequences are dire, and ostracism, you know, the, the, I talked about the East being a lot less tolerant of different opinions. It's just that they're not, they don't self-criticize. As you know, they're root, they're they're raised to distrust and, and you know Jews and to dislike to despise Zionism. You know it's illegitimate. They see themselves as victims, and they're, that's because they're raised to believe that. And many believe also that the more religious among them, not everyone, it's definitely a minority, but the more religious among them believe that once a territory is conquered by Muslims, it belongs to Allah and it can all be reversed. Meanwhile, we all worship the same God, so. You know, if it belongs to Allah, it belongs to Hashem, too. Um, so how to appeal to them? Very often, they're never going to admit that. They're never going to admit that, um, you know, that we want them over. Um, because the social capital is inherent on towing this particular party line. Um, they have a face-saving culture. I talked about this. Don't tell them you're wrong. You know, just kind of make it, make it sound like it was their idea, you know? Because that's the ultimate for them. Like, you can't. Um, you might never, but you can try. Because they're, they're risky, they can lose their family, their friends, everything if they. The Quran, Surah 10, Jonah, verse 93, says that Quran that Israel was given by Allah to Bani Israel, aka the Jews. Jerusalem is not mentioned in the Quran. It's you know, but it's the most holy city in Judaism. Um, but the thing is, Muslims also believe in a, in a and Christians too believe in replacement theology that they replaced us. So. Our, the, our holy sites are now Islamic holy sites. So that might not work, but you can try um, with the more secular ones. Um, a lot of them don't trust their governments, you know, from their home country. So if you try and make it look like it's this big government propaganda thing and you have enough proof, you'll get through to them. Just be kind, be decent, and, you know, you endear yourself to them. Don't be a jerk. Please don't be a jerk. That's the worst thing you can do. Um, here are some really good talking points when you're dealing with Muslims who are anti Israel. The Israeli government has no desire to destroy Al-Aqsa. That's like the number one argument I always get. You know, Israel wants to destroy Al-Aqsa. Even Netanyahu said that. If we wanted to, we can in a second, but we don't want to. It's, on our, it's, on, it's against what we stand for. And we have no desire to fight Arabs. You know, Netanyahu's quote about Arabs. Palestinian leaders profit off foreign aid. It's, it's a big thing. And this is me. I'm the post sign I was, you know, this is, I was one of the traitors. Um, Post-Zionist, socialist Jew, we can do better than this, hipster wants to fit in, 
and the square peg who might feel alienated from the very conformist Jewish community. I fall into the, lo the last category. That was me. I fell into the last category. Censorship, everybody's doing it. Have to be anti Israel, have a conscience. You have to look good hearted and empathetic. That's called moral narcissism. It's more, that's how you want to appear. And finally, they want to be like heroes. So often, Zionists and Jews are, young Jews are forced to choose. Social justice activism is in vogue right now. If you want to be a social justice activist, you just cannot be pro-Israel, and I'll, I'll show you why. Um, it's a guilt trip, it's intersectionality, it's, a, it's also, pro-Israel is associated with right wing, and right wing is like ult, is the ultimate thing that you don't want to be associated with. You know, you might as well like say that you wet the bed, you know, when you're 22. You know what I mean? It's just like, it, it's really not considered cool among kids. So, my story, I was kicked out of V-Day McGill. <laughs> Let me get into why and what happened. So I was involved in V-Day McGill, I, uh, which is the feminist alliance at McGill, very radical feminists. And once upon a time, they found out I was pro-Israel. I used to help you know, run these FEMT events, these discuss feminist discussion groups, and I was kicked out because they found out that I was pro-Israel. They said, quote, unquote, this is really important. You cannot possibly understand feminism and the patriarchy until you've understood that the Israeli oppression of Palestinians disproportionately affects women. Does anyone understand anything that I said? Probably not. So this is my, this is my reaction to this. You know? <laughs> so, J Street, this is where J Street comes in. They, um, these students, these Jewish students that don't want, they love Israel, but they don't want to be left out of the social justice trend, they go to J Street. They have funding from anti-Israel organizations. They're responsible for creating an anti-Israel consensus in the Democratic Party. And they're the gateway drug. That's what I call them. They're the gateway drug to anti-Israel activism. And I'm going to explain why in a little bit. So, but before I explain that, I'm going to say my road. It was very slow and gradual. Um, so my first move was I was desperate. I wanted to hate Zionism. I wanted to become an anti-Zionist because that was what was cool. I wanted to fit in with you know with all the people around me, all my friends that that cast me out for being a Zionist. So I did everything I could. I researched it. I did whatever I could to disprove Zionism. And what did I do instead? I ended up, um, you know, I, I found that Zionism was foolproof, and I found issues with leftism instead. So I felt these people are such good people. If they agree with me, they must be right. No, sorry. If they agree with me on everything else, they must be right. Um, so when you're dealing with students, do not expect change to happen overnight. No one's, no one's going to change overnight, but it's a very gradual process. I'm going to give you an example for me. So about 2011, I remember saying that if Israel has to cause so much war to keep existing, maybe it shouldn't exist at all. That was when I flirted with anti-Zionism. Israel, then, then around 2012, I thought Israel should exist, but no more settlements, and give the Arabs whatever land they want. That was naive. I was naive. And then now oh, I believe that Israel is the eternal homeland of the Jewish people period, end of story. It's very hypocritical for them to kick us out to say we can't live there, but then we let them live there. It's, it's, it's like, it's racist, it's hypocritical. How come leftists aren't realizing that? Two state, then, then um, it's about two-state solution. So back then I thought the two-state solution must happen right now. I must have added all the settlements, period, end of story. Even if we're not ready. Then I realized that we're not ready for two states until we can trust each other. Th then I thought, now I think it's our ancestral homeland they don't want two states. They want to destroy us. We should bribe their, you know, we should try, try and bribe their Arab brethren to take, it, to take them in because they're corrupt and they like money. So if we give them money, they might money might talk. So now I'm, I'm sort of like a little bit ambivalent about that idea. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm still pondering that. So first I was anti-settlement, then anti-settlement expansion. Now I'm ambivalent, and I believe Jews should be able to live wherever they want. So it, it's really, it does not. It doesn't change overnight. It really doesn't. And why? So here's who changed me. This is super important. How did I change? <laughs> Mordechai Kadar. He's a scholar in Arabic and, and Middle Eastern studies. He is, he's Israeli. He's fluent in Arabic, and you know now he's a friend of mine. Um, <laughs> so um, he basically proved to us that the that the Palestinians they say one thing in Arabic and one thing totally different in Hebrew. You know, in Israel, in English, and Hebrew. So they say in English all these peaceful things, and in Arabic they're like, we have to destroy these infidels. So if you look at the Arabic media, you'll see that it's like super anti-Semitic, super anti-Israel, 
and he speaks fluent Arabic. So he was able to like literally confront it and translate it. And you know, Pal Watch, again, also Pal Watch and Memory, they're really good channels to watch on YouTube. They translate all that stuff. Um, tribal warfare, honor and shame, you know, they see us as a source of their shame because they fought us and they lost. And every time they see us, we're a reminder that they lost. And they have a they have trouble dealing with it. Then Richard Landis, he talks about self-criticism. So he, he, he was, all that self-criticism stuff I was telling you about, how, you know, Jews love self-criticism, it's part of our, our, our tradition of questioning everything, and they don't have that. You know, they, they can't question anything that they consider sacred. And Phyllis Chesler for me, she's a feminist, she's one of the, um, the big, um, you know, like, she's, she's basically like Gloria Steinem's, you know, like, they, they, they started this whole feminist movement in the 60s, and she, you know, she reconciles Zionism with classical feminism, and so she's a perfect, you know, uh, person to explain how Zionism and feminism, you know, they're, they're, they fit together. And Alan Dershowitz is a very good voice from the left. Um, he's very easy to digest for the indoctrinated, who are indoctrinated with these leftist ideas that I talked about earlier. And there's this whole YouTube documentary, it's an hour long, it's called The Case for Israel, and it's a very good beginner's guide to pro-Israel arguments, and it's totally foolproof. You know, people like Kasim Hafiz, and they were, they were completely changed. Their minds were totally changed by that one documentary, that one book. Um, and here is stuff to avoid. If you want to shoot yourself in the foot, this is what you do. Connect Zionism to other right-wing causes. Just don't, just, just, just please, just keep it separate. It's just, it, it, you don't want to wipe the bed. Um, you can't insult Islam as an entire group. That's terrible. You know, there are a lot of my really good friends are Muslim, a lot of them are very pro-Israel, or even like they're okay with Israel, which is good enough for me. And, um, you know, and why also? Because first of all, I'm going to talk about the four groups. Academics hate sweeping generalizations, and this is a sweeping generalization. Bleeding hearts hate the hate that this invokes. Muslims, obviously, they see it as proof of what they're told by radical imams that Jews and Zionists are indeed the enemy of Islam. And so if you hear, if, you, if they see Jews saying that Islam is evil, obviously they're going to be like, yeah, see, that, that, that shows that the imams are right. And that just makes things worse between them. That's bad. Just don't do that. Another thing, leftists and you know Jews like like I was, they see you as a liability in their quest to be loved, and they see you as an embarrassment because they just want to be loved by everybody. That's all this is about, really. Okay. So case studies: the only successful campaigns against BDFs attack from the left because most are leftists. I'm going to go into these different schools very briefly. This is the fun part, guys. This is like real stuff. So this is Minnesota. So it was run by a good friend of mine named Ilan Sanelnikov, who was the, the president and founder of Student Supporting Israel, which is the group that I founded at, on Columbia's campus. So their strategy, um, their strategy was that discrimination is wrong. BDS is discrimination, therefore it's wrong. It's based on national origin. BDS also takes away safe spaces, guys, buzzwords. Use all their buzzwords. Um, it takes away the safe space for Jews and Israelis. It calls out the hypocrisy of BDS movements, fake social justice, and you know it uses messages like, we've got to unite against this. It's a call to action. It's a movement. It's a revolution. It gives people a sense of purpose and usefulness, like they're fighting for something bigger than themselves. And that's what all kids want. That's what we want to appeal to kids, what you do. So rather than against BDS, you know, it's in favor of doing this. This resolution was not, not anti-BDS. It was in favor of doing nothing. You know, it was nonpartisanship to those who don't want to take sides. You know, McGill, remember, McGill also did this. You know, McGill's campaign was about that too. This is their, their whole slogan against bigotry, against anti Semitism, it's, you know, against divestment, it, it'll, it unites these three together. This is McGill. McGill did it on shared values. and they, one of the cool things they did was they took all these leftist figureheads that leftist students worship, like Trudeau, and they said they, they, they have him quoting against BDS, you know, Moclair, Trudeau, you know, we, have a, we have a lot of allies on the left, and we need to harness these allies, you know, use quotes from them, and, and convince students that, you know, no, not everyone supports BDS, and not everyone on the left supports BDS. So it was an independent coalition of McGill students. Why is this important? Because, you know, they don't, like, if you're affiliated with, like, a Jewish group, for example, it shows, oh, yeah, well, you obviously believe this because you're Jewish. It, it's independent. It, 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 it's inclusive to everybody. It also, it, they wrote many op-eds against BDS. They had a group of 150 professors sign a petition against BDS. 
And they had, and one thing that was really crucial is that throughout the year, they did pro-Israel stuff. They had this campaign called Faces of IOC. And you know, they had this thing, everyone's doing it, it's the cool thing to do, appeal to diversity. They had these like, diverse people. And they said, like, hey, like, you know, all these people are doing it, you should do it too, be proactive. And Israel's not right wing. So you had all these big left wing people on campus saying, hey, this is an Asian guy, you know, not a Jewish, you know, saying how great Israel is. So a little digression. You need to use their arguments against them. Try and be opportunistic. Whatever you see that's against them, you use it. You, they say, you know, like, this is McGill BDS network. We're serving Palestinian food before the, um, before the, B, the, the BDS vote. It, it, it's Tabula. Like, everybody knows that Tabula is Arab, not Palestinian. And this shows that what we've been saying all along, that Palestinians are really Arabs, and that the identity was just invented in the 1960s in order to, um, to fake indigeneity when Arab colonialism stopped being cool. Outcome. BDS won by the popular vote at the McGill General Assembly. Why? Because people who are really zealous about this t take six hours out of their life to sit through this boring assembly. But then, votes have to be ratified online by the McGill student body in order to win. And, we, and more people voted no. More people voted against BDS, which is a big deal. Um, what, what does this tell us? It says there's a, there, there's, this is good news, guys. There's a silent majority of pro-Israel students on campus and we need to harness these students, or at least the students who think that singling out one country is ludicrous. So in the aftermath, people started coming out of the woodwork. They started saying, hey, BDS is not cool. There are people like me who think it's bad. You know, it's, it is not, you know, it's, it, wow, look at all these people that are speaking out. I can speak out too. Professors spoke out against it, and guess what happened? This is, this is gonna sound, this is gonna blow your mind. BDS was ruled unconstitutional by the McGill Judicial Board after the Fourth Straight Laws. This Judicial Board is run by students. Students voted that BDS is unconstitutional because it singles out citizens for, for, of one country for ostracism and creates an unsafe, an unsafe space. So after the four straight, Fourth Straight Laws, and you know the Third Straight Laws in 18 months, BDS is banned from McGill. You can never, McGill can never vote on it again. And this is a precedent that we need to set for other campuses and show that this is not okay. You know, this is against human rights and we need to, make, to ban it. It's not okay. They're not doing it for any other country. They never would. So criticism, not enough alliances with other student groups, too polished and professional. It didn't have a grassroots appeal. Um, and it didn't really appeal to the, the desire to be heroes, to be part of a movement. And you know, made some cultural events, kind of like the Palestinian food thing, you know, concretize Israel. And I'm going to show you later how they have been doing that lately, so it's good. It's an excellent campaign. I thought it was great. Embodying grassroots activism. So this is Artists for Israel. They are a group that they, they, they make art to create a passion for Zionism among like, you know, the grassroots. And who is more grassroots than these graffiti artists? They have graffiti artists. You know, they have them draw cool things about Zionism, making Zionism cool again. And this is me and some friends at the APAC conference posing with one of their displays. You know, make it grassroots. And then this is humor, guys. This is, look at this, bondage, dominant submission. <laughs> you know, so they, they mocked BDS, the BDSM Action Network. And it's a whole Facebook page that mocks BDS. And it was hilarious. You know, they took all these BDS things that the BDS people have been posting and, and making it about BDSM and like, you know, mocking it. And you know, that's the best way to make fun of it. Speaking of mocking them, was me at Columbia University. We had this big Pinocchio, and I'm going to get into what we did with the Pinocchio. This is the display that we had in front of, um, of Columbia. Look at this crazy display. It was like it was gigantic. This is also show pride. You know, show your pa show passion for Israel. Wear flags. You know, be blue and white. Like it'll show that a lot of cool kids are doing it together. You know, even if you have to get your friends from other schools to stand with you. <laughs> you know, that's the way to go about it. Um, so here's what happened. Hillel told us not to do anything. So what did we do? We said, you guys are wrong. We're going to do the opposite. So for me, I mean, I can't speak for Rudy Rockman, who was my co-president of SSI, but in my opinion, I saw it as giving them the finger because what they're doing isn't helping Israel. We wanted to just be like, you guys, your shash deal strategy, or be quiet, not rock the boat, preach the choir, it's not helping. This is 
is my way of standing against it. And so they told us that we're not doing it, you can't do it either. So the more you do, the more they do in reaction. That's what they say. It's not true. It's not true. I mean, I went to Stand With Us conferences, people talked about their strategies. The truth is, is that if you have, if, if Palestinians have an established group on campus and has strong backing, it can be dangerous to be to, sit, to not do anything because we're just sitting ducks. They're going to grow. They're going to be opportunistic. They're going to take advantage of the fact that there's no opposition, and they're going to think that these people are unanimous on campus. And that's the worst thing to think because this everybody's doing it thing. You know, it's going to backfire. It's going to it's going to be horrible for us. It is true when there is no Palestinian group on campus and there's no anti-Israel group, no Muslim Students Association. Then it's then you know then if you start to make an Israel group and do stuff, sometimes it causes them to react. Sometimes. Um, but also realize that there's going to be a time if you do start a pro-Israel group, there's, if we get to them first, that's good. So starting a group, it, it's better than not starting a group. So we, have, we had a biased student government. And why do we see their bias? Because they came over to us wearing a kofiyah and a BDS t-shirt. The president and the vice president of the student governing board came up to us. And so we just kind of laughed in their face. We're like, you guys seriously think that you're not biased if you're wearing a freaking kofiya? Like, are you kidding me? So we mailed it to the press because they made it take us down. The government came up, the student government came up to us and said, you guys can't have this. And at Columbia, the students were on the show, student governing board, what they say goes. You know, you can't go against them. That's why that's such a big problem. So, but Hillel surprisingly continued to slander us. They slandered me, they tried to ruin my name. And I'm gonna get into more detail about that. Why is this not moving? Sorry guys. There we go. So this guy from Hillel, he posted this thing on the Columbia Facebook group. He said, SSI is a group that is not, he's from Hillel, by the way. He said, SSI is a group that is not recognized by the university because it doesn't have enough members to be an official group. How does he know? He never spoke to any of us. And first of all, we were an official group on campus. We, we were. And we had 200 people sign up for our mailing list. So yeah, no, no members, absolutely. Um, and also, they pretty much defended the student governing board's decision to take it down. They said that to say that this occurred because SJP, because of SJP members, so the anti-Israel group on campus, being on the governing board is racist. So they said that accusing these people that came up to us wearing a kofia and a um, and a BDS T-shirt, telling us to take it down for literally no good reason, they think we're being racist by calling them biased. Is that And these are Jewish students. This is Hillel saying, and this is the press. These are all people that are execs of Hillel. All those likes student executives. And so while we were doing the Pinocchio, this um, girl comes up to us from Hillel. She said, I'm from Hillel. Okay, so look at this article that was just published about you guys. And it was literally published like two seconds before she came to see us. And they said they have one source. And that one source said that we're not affiliated with Aria Hillel or any pro-Israel groups and that we're right-wing fringe. And this mirrors a lot of what they've been saying to us on Facebook. We knew that Hillel was behind this op-ed in the paper. They literally slandered us. And they said, you know, this is not working. You guys need to take this down. And I'm going to get into why they do things like that. So what did they do to us to demonize me and us? They told everyone, when I started SSI, they told everyone that I was a right-wing extremist and that SSI is a right radical group with no evidence. Again, as I said, right-winger is the worst insult you can possibly give a college student. And they had zero evidence. Coercion. So three of our SSI board members were told they either leave or be ostracized by Hillel. If you want friends, they told me they're like, we really don't, we really want to have our friends. You know, we have, they made us choose if you want friends or if you want to be part of our group. It's terrible. And so they had to leave. They left. They quit. They quit. And then right after, interestingly, we saw they became execs of the Hillel group. So they kind of poached them. Manufactured evidence. So one time I posted on this Stop BDS task force, um, it's a silent protest for BDS, the BDS 101 event. We had a BDS 101 event. We w I wanted to do a silent protest with Israeli flags, just standing outside the building, being totally peaceful, holding flags, just to show that there's opposition, that we're out there, that is not unanimous. It's just, it makes a big difference, even though if you, even if you don't say a word. And they, the Hillel people told them that I planned to shove the speakers down 
and stage a walkout, and they demonized me and SSI as radical. So they totally made up a big lie. And the crazy part is that one of the board members of SSI that ended up leaving later told me, she's like, you have to take this down, that post down, you know, like, they're going to think it's so radical, take it down. So what ends up happening was is that I don't, the post that I posted about, you know, that I can use to prove that they're, that they're, that I did not plan a walkout, that I did not plan to shut the speakers down. Anyone who knows me knows that I'm all for freedom of speech. I'm, I'm a li very libertarian. So that post is not there anymore. So now I have no proof that what I, that, that I didn't tell, that I didn't plan a, 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 a shutdown, which is kind of bad. I should have kept it up. But I didn't know that she was going to leave and that she was a, a double agent. So also they bought likes. So while we gained popularity, you know, SSI, Student Supporting Israel National, their social media person called me on the phone and said, they just bought 2,000 likes. REA, the Hillel student group, bought 2,000 likes on Facebook. Why? Because we climbed so much after the Pinocchio, like the, the whole, it went all over the news, it was a big thing. Everyone started liking us, we, we almost overcame them in likes, and they bought 2,000 likes. I'm like, how do you know this? Because she's like, we've been watching them, because we know about the Pinocchio, we're watching both of these groups to see how it affects you guys. We noticed that in two, in one second, they got 2,000 likes. It's pretty, pretty good evidence, right? SSI, a social media um, analyst, has told, called me and told me that. You can buy like, these companies, they, 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 they fool the system into believing there's more likes than actually are. They create, they have like these like fake accounts that they use to like bought, to, to, to pretend to like something and then they have an automatic switch they use to make them like one thing. It's a program. And so people can buy likes, it's, it's, you can buy it on the internet to make it look like it's more popular than it is. Why? Because they, they knew we were doing stuff and they weren't. We were getting all the attention and they weren't. They didn't like that. They wanted to stay the voice of Israel at Columbia. They wanted to stay the established group. What? I'm getting into it. I'm getting into it. I'm getting into it. You're going to love this. You're going to love what comes next, guys. Come on. Um, I'm actually getting exactly that. So, but before I do that, I'm going to talk about the Hillel Sija model. So they, they, their whole premise is the following. They believe that activism is radical and therefore bad. That must be curved, and activists must be ostracized. So they wield social capital as a weapon. If you're an activist, they'll, they'll, they'll literally, they'll, they'll make you look like a radical, they'll paint you as a, as a horrible person, as a radical, as a nut job, and then you'll lose all your followers. You know, they'll say that the community doesn't support you. They say, we need to be the better person, we need to stay quiet, we can't rock the boats, we want people to love us. You know, and they have this idea that if we love our enemies, they will love us. And it's very oversimplified because they don't realize that if, you know, that anti-Semitism is irrational and they also ignore the opportunism of our opposition. They take advantage of our silence. We need to focus on the fence sitters, people that are on the fence um, that don't have an opinion, which is most people. Sucking up to those who are our sworn enemies will make us look weak and pathetic. It's called dimitude. There's a word for that. And it doesn't mean that we need to be jerks. We need to be, we, we always need to be kind. We have nothing to lose by staying kind. And we need to be firm, so civil but firm. So why does Hillel and Sija, they know it doesn't work. They know it doesn't work. I've had people from Hillel and Sija who worked for them tell me privately that we know it doesn't work, but why do they do it? It lets them get away with doing nothing because we make them look bad and we threaten their donations. Hold on. So Sija, Sija is the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs in Canada. They have a, their strategy is based on passiveness. You have to be passive, um, you know, because the crazy, they think, oh, those radical people out there are crazy. If we look like the normal ones, you know, then we look better. But unfortunately with students, they don't have uh, the discernment here. And students are the future. We need to focus on the students because they're going to be leaders of tomorrow. As, so Sija will claim that their strategy of being passive is supported by studies. And then you ask them to find, to ask them which specific studies, and there are no studies. You find out there are no studies. They will hem and ha and oh, I don't know. Well, I'll find it. I'll get back to you. I'll get back to you, and they never get back to you. So, and then I have someone from some insiders, some CJ telling me they don't actually have studies. It's all fake. Um, they don't do much of substance. They pay their executives exorbitant salaries from the donations of well-meaning Jews. So donate to people that actually do stuff like CIJR. CIJR does a wonderful work for the Jewish community. They actually really, they work so hard and they've been working hard for 28 years and we need support groups like that. Um, 
and they also a good documentary about it is this documentary called Shah Steel, and it basically exposes all the corruption in the federations and in the Jewish community in Canada and mon mostly Montreal and Toronto. So it's really an important documentary. It's called Shah Steel by Ben Pfefferman. It's for free on YouTube. It's definitely something to watch. <coughs> so what happened at Columbia? Electronic Intifada posted an article about about um, our Pinocchio. They spent about 90% of it basically slandering Rudy with claims that he can possibly sue for. Um, Rudy is the president of Student Supporting Israel, and they basically said, made up all this up on him. But for me, they dug up that um, stuff that I looked at and I kind of laughed. I was like, that's not even bad. You know, because I thought this is a mainstream view, you know, by Jews. So the, by Jew all I care about is, you know, making the Jewish community happy because it's my community. I called Jewish Voice for Peace, which is the Jewish anti-Israel group on campus. I called them Kapos. I did. Um, you know, because here's my logic here. I thought Kapos meant any Jew that supported Hitler at any point in the Third Reich. You know, they, they supported Hitler and they supported the Nazis. Um, and I see Hamas as Nazis. They have the same goal. They want to kill every Jew. So I, 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 I basically say that these people, these Jewish Voice for Peace that support Hamas and that apologize for Hamas, they're basically the equivalent to supporting Nazis. So they are Kapos. That's what I thought. But apparently I got, I mean, I got the definition of capo wrong. Capo actually meant Jews that were forced, you know, to, um, in, in, in the concentration camps, to rat out their fellow Jews. And they were abused and it was horrible and many of them were forced. And, you know, I kind of felt awful saying, I, I, you know, when I found out what capos actually meant, I felt, oh my God, I'm insulting capos. Because these J Jewish boys were peace people, you know, they, they actually, you know, they, 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 they actually choose to do this. They have a choice. So what happens? I, I expected to get some support from Hillel because I thought, oh yeah, that's the mainstream Jewish view. So this is Jewish Voice for Peace accusing me of hate speech on their public Facebook page because I called, you know, because I called them Kapos. And then Columbia Hillel came out and said that they they basically had this whole entire statement saying that we stand with our brothers and sisters at this anti-Israel group, Jewish Voice for Peace. We, you know, our brothers and sisters. Like, we should be ostracizing these people. We should be making them feel like pariahs. We should not be embracing them as part of our community. This is, they're not real Jews because Zionism and Judaism are the same thing. You know, Jewish people pray to Zion. We pray, you know, to be next year in Jerusalem. We, we, we you know, it's, all, it's in our Torah. Our whole Torah is about our connection to the land. They're basically denying, you know, everything that we Jews stand for. So I don't think they're, you know, I don't think that they may be Jewish by blood, but they're not Jewish in their hearts. Um, so what happened? The administration wasn't pleased. They basically co told Rudy, you know, you, you can't do this. It will attract the media. The media already thinks that we're anti-Semitic. So, you know, just, just, just lay low, you know, otherwise we're gonna consider taking away your club status. This club status that Hillel claims we don't have. They say, we're gonna take away your club status. It's kind of funny, isn't it? Um, and if we, you know, so we didn't table on Thursday and Friday. We just didn't want to start a kerfuffle. So Rudy met with Hillel, and Hillel actually admitted to him that they tried to sabotage us all year. Why? Because they saw us as a threat. They, they thought that our activism, they didn't like our activism. We, we thought we'd be upstaged them. Um, so on Friday, interestingly, the apartheid wall did not go up either. So I wonder if the administration was cracking down on them too, because he made such a stink. BDS died that day. At Columbia's campus, it died. There was no mention of it afterwards. There was no, there was no events, you know, because it really, it started out really strong with full steam. There was events every week. It was a big deal. And then it just literally, it was humiliated by the Pinocchio. So what happened? It wasn't brought up again. There were no votes on BDS as they promised there would be. So we upset the administration, but we caused them to be like, oh my God, you guys at SJP need to calm down because you're going to cause this whole thing. You know, the Jews are going to react and then they're going to react. And it's going to, you know, so they basically stopped everybody, not just us. We scared them into submission by showing that we are not afraid to fight, and this is what we need to keep doing. So the enemy is among us. So not every Hillel does this. There are a lot of Hillels. I would say most Hillels actually are very good, and they they do what they're supposed to do. But there are some at very key campuses um, because of many attempts to infiltrate and um, and to brainwash the the to subvert and brainwash the leaders of tomorrow. And Hillel International has been also infiltrated by some subversive and well -we and weak-willed leadership. So they allow anti-Israel activities within Hillel, even though they say they don't, they do. And I'll show you what happened. I'll show you what's going on. 
and they wield social capital as a weapon. Again, if you speak out against them, you get ostracized, so students are afraid to speak out against them. And they're only sorry when they got caught. And I'm going to tell you this event at Brown University. Um, they planned an event, what? Um, five minutes. Yeah. So Jews facing the Nakba, Brown Rizzi Hillel hosted it. And they, they, they sponsored it, and they knew what was going on for four months. They, did, they, they were totally behind it until I wrote an article whistleblowing it, and they, and they, they got an outcry. It was shared 7,000 times. They got, they, their phones were off the hook saying, why, you can't do this, it's anti-Israel. What is this, Jews facing the Nakba? It was, it was Zohrot, which is an anti-Israel NGO that came and brainwashed students to believe that this whole group, Zohrot, is based on spreading the Palestinian narrative. You know, they spread the Palestinian narrative. They, they, they basically mourn. This is mourning the foundation of the state of Israel. And they're doing it with Jews. They're getting Jews to mourn the foundation of their own state because it was so bad. And they're getting Jews to feel ashamed of themselves. So I decided to go to the event, right? And so I, I get a call in the morning I was supposed to go. And it was the guy who told me to go. He said, don't go. It's canceled. Really, it's canceled. Yeah, like all the callers, all the people have been calling in have been called. They've been called back by Hillel saying that it's canceled. Well, really, it's canceled, right? I got invited to a secret event because I RSVP. They, but I found out later that it was a deep one. I'll talk to you about why. The event was canceled because of security concerns. The Hillel building will be closed at 7 p.m. Message me, you know, if you have any questions. So the event was canceled at 6 p.m. The event was supposed to be at like 8, uh, at, um, 8 p.m. And it was canceled. And then I found out by my friend who was supposed to, you know, like my friend who helped me with this whole thing, he found out that they actually did have the event. They sent it as private messages. They sent it in emails to people they trust. And they still held the event. So this is the food. This is the quinoa. I'll show you the quinoa right here that they had that they served there. And if you look very closely, they published the, um, they published the pictures of the event that actually happened, and this is like about 100 people in there. There's still quinoa. It's the same quinoa. They, the Hillel served a food from their official caterer to this event. You don't believe me still? Oh, so, so sorry, this is before it was an article from so, um, and it says that so Sophie Kasakov, who was an organizer, said that Hillel was helping them every step of the way. Hillel supported us completely in going behind the ba their backs. And it, they lied to their supporters, to their donors, and said, you know, see, we're not anti-Israel. We, we canceled it. They only canceled it because I wrote that article. You know, they wouldn't have canceled it if I had not written that article. So what is, why is Hillel doing this? So, breaking, so Hillel hosted Breaking the Silence the other day. And, um, and Breaking the Silence only serves to create anti-Israel students who are ashamed of being, you know, of, of, their, of their, their, their roots. You know, they're ashamed of themselves. And, um, and so it just it creates this culture of shame. So I love Israel so much, but insert why it's terrible. So there's no reasons to love Israel. So you, you brainwash students with all these horrible things Israel is doing. You call it self-criticism. And you don't give any reason to love Israel. They say we just want to improve it, but provide nothing about Israel that is there is to love. So students start to question, why should I love Israel if it does all these awful things? And it plants a seed. And that's why I say that J Street, which has this mentality, is the gateway drug. So people start to, you know, think, wow, the anti-Israel students are actually right. You know, because look at all these things they're saying. Look, all these, this Jewish group, Hillel, is saying it too. So it must be right. And it becomes a consensus. So this is uh, Breaking the Silence. They had it at Columbia. I fell in it. Um, and they were, um, all, they were investigated by the Israeli government because they, they first of all, they... Um, they get paid by European NGOs to um, provide testimonials against Israel, and they um, and they also were caught selling intelligence information, you know, classified info to the highest bidder. Finally, I'm going to finish this talk by talking about why should not why is this 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 talk fi fighting back against BDS? Why is that? Why is it wrong to call it that? Why is that a totally wrong approach? Fighting makes us look like we're on the defensive, like we're hiding something instead of using their strategies against them. We need to use our strategies against them. Repetition. If you repeat things enough times, it will stick. Apartheid, for example, the apartheid analogy. Israel's apartheid. Israel's apartheid. You hear it everywhere, and eventually you believe it. Even if you, like, you know, there's no proof. So the id, the emotion. The lower brain cells centers process information first. 
It's the emotional switch. Once you flip the emotional switch, you show a picture of a dead baby in Gaza, and you can never convince them again. Because you look like a jerk, you know, if you argue against a dead baby. Storytelling. Arabs have a very rich tradition of Hakawati storytelling. Their storytelling is, you know, it's built on, you know, hyperbole, on these great, amazing, fantastical stories of heroes and, and, and stuff like that. And, you know, the, making stuff up is their, it, it's what they're good at. You know, so <laughs> we're not good at that. Um, we're very, we're too cerebral. So fighting back against BDS, back, because we need to be proactive, not reactive. Otherwise, they win before we even begin. First cut is the deepest. People usually believe the first thing they hear. And finally, against BDS. So if we use the term BDS in our event names and advertisements, it's free advertisement to BDS. So we need to keep the elephant in the room and let it deliberately conf uh, confront you. Free advertising. So I'm almost done. This is the last slide. Creative ways to fight BDS. Interactive activities that make people feel good about themselves, make people feel like they belong, like they're accepted. It makes people feel like they're part of an important movement, a revolution, and it makes people feel that they can make a difference. And remember guys, if there's one take home message I can give you is that justice is more important than peace. If you have a peace without justice, then it's, it's a human rights violation in itself. It's wrong. It's, it's categorically morally wrong. So that you just you can't argue that. If you, you can't argue for peace without proving that you're also just. Israeli cooking classes, we have good food. The way people's heart is through their stomach. <laughs> um, poetry slam, you get people to share, get people to feel like they're part of this, you know, sharing poetry. Storytelling, you have people tell their stories about what happens to them. People hear about true peop real people that they, that they see right in front of them. You know, IDF soldiers, for example, talking about their service. That goes a long way. And finally, kids love to protest everything. You know this, you know how much college students love to protest. You know, we have a lot to protest about. We have Hamas that is shooting rockets indiscriminately into, you know, our population centers. You know, so we, we, we should definitely have, we, we shouldn't be hateful in our protests. You know, the Palestinian protests are very hateful. They're very anti-Israel. You know, they get anti-Semitic sometimes. We should be proud. We should sing Jewish songs, have Jewish cultural festivals, you know, endear people to our culture and invite everybody in. And this is a one good, this is Hillel and Sija, got a hand to them. They, um, a white night in Tel Aviv, they had this big party and it was like off the hook and they had like everyone come and it was really cool. Um, and uh, it sort of endeared people to Israeli culture. Show them they're just like us. And like my, my takeaway message, harness PR. pro Israel groups focus too much on fundraising and not enough on PR. With good PR and a good brand, you need to make this a brand. And the fundraising will do itself. Kids don't care enough about the quality of the product. They care about how it's portrayed. You know, think about how many, how many of you have kids? Raise your hand. How many of you had a kid <laughs> who saw something on TV and said, I want it, mommy, I want it, you know, or daddy? How, of course, everyone. So, I mean, it doesn't matter. You don't know what quality it is. All that matters is how it's portrayed. So if, if, if quality mattered, the, the whole field of marketing would not exist. So we need to make it about marketing, we need to make it about PR. We need to sell our story, sell Zionism. J Street, for example. J Street was, again, the rumor has it that it was founded by George Soros. He's a billionaire who is a self-hating Jew. And he's, he's open about being a self-hating Jew. Um, he, so he apparently, allegedly got these two people, Jeremy ben Ami and Daniel Levy, who are the top PR people in the world. You know, they, they ran the top PR firms in the whole world and they wanted to get Israel where they're weak. So J Street was founded, and the whole point was it was a P, it was based on PR. That's all it was, and they won the government over. They're single-handedly responsible for changing the discourse, you know, about Israel in the government. You notice J Street was founded in 2008, and ever since then it was a big downhill slope. Okay, you notice that? They, they PR makes a big impact. A brand makes a big impact. Okay, so making Zionism cool again. That's the whole thing that we gotta do. Everyone's doing it. Make it a brand. <laughs> then kids will like it. Our story. Talk about our story. We were an oppressed people. We rose from the ashes. We are indigenous to our land. Israel was the only sovereign nation. Everybody else was a colonialist. And finally, 
we need to point, we, we were always seeking to return. We always prayed to go back to Israel, to go back to Jerusalem. That's a big thing. And speaking of always seeking to return, we need to point out the narrative inversion. So pa Palestinians took our narrative and made it theirs. And we need to point that out. We need to call it out for what it is. Finally, we need to make people want to be part of our movement. You know, like Nike, just do it. Um, and, and, and at last, you know, we need to think about how we do advocacy in terms of PR. So no more apologies. We can't apologize for who we are. We can't apologize for what we do. If we do something wrong and somebody confronts us, fine, we can admit it. If we've done research and if we know for sure. You know, we know all the falsehoods that's out there. People make up stuff about Israel all the time. There's a whole industry about doing that. But it's not good PR to just point it out ourselves, you know, to the public. But we need to focus on what's good PR. You know, oh, wait. Come on. Examples. What's the other word? For Israel, indigenous. Standing in solidarity with the nation oppressed for millennia, rose from the ashes, we have overcome. And this is the last slide, guys. Um, this is, I have a very popular um, series called The Biggest Mistakes Pro Israel Advocates Make on, uh, it's on um, Israeli Cool. And what I want to do is what I did just now, that's not how you do advocacy to students. How do you do advocacy, how do you do advocacy to students? Improv games. Raise your hand if you're interested in doing an improv game and seeing how improv can help the Zionist movement. I'm, I've been doing improv for years.